So I want to, um, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the New Testament, to John's Gospel account and uh, chapter 5. Gospel of John, uh, according to John chapter 5. And I'm going to read a few verses um, just to familiarise you with the story. John 5. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people blind, lame, paralysed waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then, whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made whole? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk and immediately the man was made well took up his bed and walked and that day was the sabbath the jews therefore said to him who was cured it's the sabbath it's not lawful for you to carry your bed he answered them he who made me well said to me take up your bed and walked then they asked him who is the man who said to you take up your bed and walk but the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. It's a great question, isn't it? That Jesus asked this man a very simple question. Will you be made whole? Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be whole, healed? Now the Bible tells us the pool of Bethesda, as it was known, had five porches and in these porches lay a, a great multitude of sick people blind, lame, paralysed people waiting for the moving of the water it's a strange, it's actually a strange kind of story this or account because it says in verse 4 an angel would come down at certain times and stir up the water and at that point as the water was stirred the first one into the water was instantly healed <coughs> how often the angel came down we don't know we're not told it could have been any time nobody kind of knew they couldn't kind of set their watches by the time of day or the day that this angel would appear or would come down because they just didn't know it could be any day but here's the picture here's this pool and a great multitude every day the blind would be led in the lame would be carried in others with all kinds of sickness and disease would make their way to this pool of Bethesda 
somehow in hope that they might be the one that went into that water when the angel stirred it up, or at least be the first in the water. Now the blind couldn't see, so they had to sit there or lay there just listening, trying to tune their ears finally into any kind of movement in that water where they would perceive that it was the angel that had come. So the blind would be listening. But when the water stirred, too often for them it would be too late. The lame needed help. Others with diseases, etc., would often need help to be the first in that pool. And the paralyzed basically had no chance unless there was someone that could roll them into that water for them to be the first in to be healed. So I want you to see this. The only one who got healed when this occurrence took place was the first one to get into that water when the angel stirred it up. When that happened, others would plunge into the water. It would be like a race, if you like, as, as much as a race could be with sick and impotent people. But others would, would roll in or jump in and, and only to surface again, absolutely soaking wet, but disappointed because they would hear at one side of the pool someone shouting with ecstatic shouts of joy because he was the one who had been delivered and been healed because he was the one who was the first in the water. For the rest, it would be disappointment again and frustration. Now this man in John chapter 5 had had an infirmity for 38 years. Probably many years just laying at the side of this pool day after day after day. This was the most depressing place you could ever be in. As soon as you walked in to near the pool of Bethesda, to these five porches, the atmosphere would hit you. It would be an atmosphere of depression, of frustration, of disappointment, and in some cases probably anger and resentment. We have to spend another day here just kind of trying to muster up some hope, only for it to be shattered with despair. The conversation was always the same. There was no faith or hope in the conversation. The conversation was always in the depths. The gutter of despair. This was one of the most depressing places you could ever be in, in Jerusalem. But it was to this very place that the Son of God, Jesus, came. And he's walking around these sick people. There's some things in the Bible I don't understand. Why Jesus did certain things. Because he must have gone by many, many sick people. Strode over some. Until he comes to this one man. Who had been laid on his bed. Day after day. For 38 years. And when Jesus sees him lying there, he says, Do you want to be made whole? Why such a question? Jesus asked a blind man. Bartimaeus, after he'd cried out on the wayside, Son of David, have mercy on me. And his friends, the crowd, had said, be quiet, be quiet. But Bartimaeus said, 
cried out even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says, Jesus, the Son of God, stood still for a beggar. And he says, bring him to me. And Bartimaeus takes off his cloak, which was, which was really kind of like a, a blind man throwing his cane away because the cloak represented his blindness. And he stands before Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Seems a silly question. Well, he's not going to say, well, I've got a bit of flu. His main problem was he was blind. That I might receive my sight. Jesus asked questions, my friends, for a reason. And he looks at this man, lay on his bed, in all his despair, do you want to be made whole? 38 years is an awful long time to be sick and impotent. But Jesus wants to know something from this man. That's why he asked the question. The thing is, Jesus wants to know, has this man been programmed so much with his sickness that he's accepted this is his lot for the rest of his life? Had the years taken their toll and pushed him into resignation of this kind of life for the rest of his life, it's a terrible position to be in. So Jesus says, well, do you want to change? Do you want to be made whole? Tell me if you really want to be out of this situation. And that question had to be answered. You see, my friends, situations that we come into can program our minds. Do you know the mind is a very powerful thing? For those of you that are really born again and have really come to know Jesus Christ, let me tell you, the only way you will ever change and be transformed is by the renewing of your mind. Did you know there are some things that God will not do for you? We have to do them ourselves. He said to his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples. Listen, Jesus doesn't make disciples, we do. That's our job. He doesn't do what he's given us the job to do. And Paul says, present your body as a living sacrifice, which is acceptable, your reasonable sacrifice, acceptable to God, and be renewed and be transformed, I should say, by the renewing of your mind. The only way we change is when our mind gets renewed. And your mind gets renewed as you meditate in the word of God and begin to understand who you really are. I have a pastor friend in this country and years ago when his two boys were small... They adopted a little black girl. The boys, the pastor's white, his wife was white, the kids were white, but they adopted a little black girl. And this is what he used to say. He used to say, when these two came along, we didn't have a choice. He said, oh, we love them, but we didn't know whether they were going to be a boy or a girl. But we got two boys. But we didn't have a choice. But to make the little black girl feel special... He says, but we chose her. Yeah. Did you know, my friend, Christian friend here tonight, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, that from the foundation of the world, God chose you and me in Christ 
Before he created a world, he knew you in his foreknowledge. He preordained you. He chose you and he sent his Holy Spirit to arrest you. And if you're not saved tonight, you're in this meeting. I want to say to you, I've got a feeling that you've been chosen as well because God, the Holy Spirit, brought you here to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. See, when you get those truths into your heart and mind, and I begin to meditate on that and believe that God chose me in Christ before he ever created the world, that has to make me feel utterly and absolutely important. I mean, that gives me self-esteem. Self-esteem is nothing to do with your job. It's nothing to do with what you do. It's nothing to do with anything like that. Self-esteem is knowing who you are in Christ. You know, one, one preacher said these words, and I quote. He said, I dare not think about myself anything, any thought other than what God thinks about me. That's right. Think about that. I dare not think any thoughts about myself other than what God thinks about me. We're all too prone to put ourselves down. In this story, Jesus is all about picking somebody up. And that's what he's all about. 38 years was a long time. And during that time, the situation of being in this depressive place every day Jesus wanted to know, has this programmed your mind? Can you see yourself any different? Can, do, you, do you really want to be made whole? Because situations can program us into defeat. The prodigal son had to change his mind. That's how it all began. His way home began when he changed his mind. That's actually what repentance means. It's a change of mind. A turnaround. Changed his direction because he thought to himself, here I am eating husks that the pigs have left behind, smelling of pig fodder. And he said even the servants have a bed and a meal two or three times a day in my father's house and here I am his son and the servants are better off than me that's why he turned around and changed his mind and made his way back home that was the beginning of the journey back do you want to be made whole you know as churches we have to see beyond where we're at it's called vision. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist says, the Lord is the lifter of my head. If you ever see anyone that's depressed, their head will drop. And they're looking down. The psalmist says, the Lord is the lifter of my head. He lifts me up. So I can face life and I can know him. Praise the Lord. A few years ago in the Assemblies of God conference over here in Bradford, I, I was there when they had a guest speaker from Egypt, Cairo. And he has a church or at least a few years ago, they numbered somewhere around about 10,000 people. But they were once a small church in a huge city with great problems, with drug addiction, with marriages falling apart, with, you know, you name it, it was all happening. And so he and his leaders got together and they looked again at the verse in John chapter 4, when Jesus said to his disciples, lift up your eyes, lift, lift them up and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. 
And as leaders, they discuss that scripture and ask themselves this question. Do we believe what he's saying? Do we believe that the fields are white? That people are ready to be reaped and brought into the kingdom? Do we believe that we can grow? Do we believe we can reach a world that's in a mess? And they came to the conclusion, we have to believe God rather than the devil. We don't want to be programmed with our minds to seeing just the problems. But let's look at the problems as a way in which we can reach the people. Do you understand? So what they did was, they started, they said, what are the problems? And they began to name a few. The first one was marriage breakup. So they began to advertise seminars on healing the marriage problem. And Muslims started to come, many Muslims, because their marriages were breaking up just as much as anyone else's. And their marriages started to be healed. And some of these people got saved because they'd been so helped and blessed and they went and told their friends and, and, and brought more to these. And so Muslims started to get, what, what are the other problems, they thought? Drug addiction. So they put seminars on to help drug addicts and, and you know, different seminars for different problems that they were facing in the city. And they began to see people coming because do you know what, what evangelism works the world over? It's need-oriented evangelism. When we're meeting the needs of society and when we're offering them hope for their mess. And listen, folks, as the, world, as the, as the coming of the Lord draws near, the Bible says in Timothy, Paul writes that, that perilous times will come. It's not going to get better out there. But this is the opportunity for the church in these last days to say, well, this is the time of harvest. The fields are white unto harvest. They began to meet the needs. And then on top of all that, God began to give some of these Muslim people visions and dreams of Jesus. And he actually said to us at the conference, he said, there was one man locally, a local man who was more like the Saul of Tarsus locally, hated Christianity. And the Holy Spirit gave, gave him a vision in broad daylight, not at night, in broad daylight, Jesus appears to him. And this man gets wonderfully saved. Amen. The church begins to grow. Why? Because their vision, they changed direction. They began to believe the word of God. Do you want to be made whole? Or do you want to lie in this place of sickness and disease for the rest of your life? Do you want to change your situation? I'm going to ask you tonight. You may be here and you've never been saved. I don't know you all. You may have never given your life to Christ. You may have never visited Calvary by faith. You may have never realized, perhaps up till this evening, that the Son of God loved you as much as he loved me or anybody else, enough to die for you and take your sins upon his body, upon the cross. Tonight, I'm going to ask you, do you want to be made whole? When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he lost a very important part of his own makeup. We are spirit soul and body. We are spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. In the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam, you will die. When Adam ate, he didn't drop dead physically. He didn't cease and die mentally, but spiritually inside. His spirit was encased in a spiritual Death. He was only two-thirds alive. You see, when you meet Jesus, like I said this morning, he's the resurrection and the life. Yeah. Yeah. He said, I am come that you might have life. Yeah. And you might have it on another dimension, more abundantly. Amen? Amen? Somebody said, there's no dress rehearsals in life. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. 
you're on stage the curtain has opened and one day the curtain will close and then where will you go where will you spend eternity so the question is do you want to be made whole do you want to discover this life that Jesus offers you tonight to be made whole starts when you receive Christ into your spirit and you become alive the man answered back to Jesus he said I, I've, I've got no one to put me in the water there was a glimmer of hope in other words he was saying well yeah you know I, 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 I would but there's nobody to to help me and sometimes people feel helpless don't they but Jesus was on hand you know in in I think it's in the, the book there's always a way back there's a story of Val's dad how he got converted he became a eventually became a assemblies of God pastor but you know um, just before Val was born uh, he was he was a real drunkard you, you know when men used to come on from where he used to work in the mines and then he worked in Hawker Siddeley in the laboratory uh, towards the end of his uh, working life but he used to come on with his you know men would have a wage packet wouldn't they you know it'd be cash there was no credit cards then folks no need for plastic surgery in those days <laughs> but uh, you know they would come on with cash he'd spend most of it on drink most of it on drink he'd come back at night and his wife Val's mother could hear the key fumbling in the door looking he was trying to find the lock it was anywhere but where the lock was because he was so drunk she sent him one day on a Saturday for a pound of sausages just down the road he never came back they found him wrapped round a lamppost drunk with sausages basically around his neck <laughs> but <laughs> this is true a mother a mother saved she she got saved and she she was in the open air on Wigan, Wigan Market Square he used to come out of the pub and he would heckle in the crowd the people that were preaching the gospel but he saw this young woman who he set his eyes upon and he thought I'm gonna marry her that was Val's mother and one night the Word of God got got hold of him and I, I remember him taking me to Wigan Market Square you know the old cobbles they have built over it now but but it used to be an open square and and he said to me he said that and he points this one cobble he says that's where I knelt and gave my life to Jesus Christ and he was totally and absolutely transformed and he used to give his testimony and he used to talk about Jesus changing water into wine he says but friends when I got saved Jesus changed wine into furniture <laughs> hallelujah praise the Lord so here's the king of glory standing over a man who's desperate asking him a simple question do you want to be made whole I've got no one to push me in the water but here's the king of glory little does he know that this man who's standing over him asking this question is the one who created oceans and seas and lakes and meadows one who could command and everything came into being through the power of his word and Jesus looks at him and says rise take up your bed and walk here's the word here's the transforming word rise get up take up your bed and walk in other words Jesus was saying come on rise up into a new position 
I'll tell you tonight, Jesus never leaves people in the depths. He changes sinners to sons and daughters, captives to freedom. He takes the old and gives us the new. You see, when anyone comes to know Christ, he doesn't push them down, he lifts them up. And there's a big difference in looking down on something or looking up. When we first got to Chicago and you get on off the train station and you go on to Michigan Avenue, my brother-in-law was just telling me just yesterday, he said, I'll never forget, you were smiling as you took us to Chicago for the first time and we got out of that train station, stepped onto Michigan Avenue and you watched my face and he went... (laughs) And these huge skyscrapers and hotels towering right above the city on occasions, and I quickly add on occasions, I think we've done it twice since we've been there. We've been onto the 91st floor of the Hancock Centre. You you stand in this lift and with a click of your finger, you're on the 91st floor. And we've had lunch there, looking out over the city. And you're actually, that's the second largest building in Chicago after Willow Tower. It used to be Sears Tower. And you're looking down on huge hotels and high rises and and you can see on the tops of these swimming pools and 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 it's a different you know when you stand there in the street and you look up it all all kind of makes you dizzy looking up but when you're looking down on something it's a totally different perspective this man had laid on his bed for 38 years looking up but Jesus said I'm going to raise you up now do you know, my friends, this is, this is amazing. There's some people in Christianity, in, in churches, that are always praying to break through demonic powers. Oh, we've got to break through. Listen, in my Bible, in Ephesians 2, it says, I am seated with Christ in heavenly places far above all principality and power. You can labour if you want, but I'm through. Hallelujah. 38 years. Now rise. You don't need an angel. I created angels. You don't need anyone else to help you. Here's the word of God. Life is waiting for you. Tonight, my friend, whoever you are or however old you are, listen, life is is waiting for you. The Saviour is waiting for you. It's been on hold maybe for so long. It's evaded you. You thought you could never be different. You've been programmed into this and into that. But life is waiting. Don't let the world program you or the devil. Some people say, well, I I can never be forgiven. Oh, yes, you can. Jesus took every sin, every fault, upon himself upon the cross he bore it for us he became our substitute did you know that God can't overlook sin because he's holy he has to judge sin because he's a holy God and so because God so loved the world and he wanted to rescue us He has to judge sin in order to be able to turn to you and me and say, right, now you can freely be forgiven. What did he do? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Isaiah saw it all through the telescope of prophecy and says he was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. Sin was laid upon him that we might be blessed. So what did God do? He judged sin upon his son, Jesus Christ, upon the cross. He took the punishment for us. You don't have to take it, my friend. It's free. It's called grace. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you something, it's more than mercy. If you were up in court and you were found, you know, you'd committed some crime 
and the judge bangs his hammer down and says, well, I know you're guilty, but <clears throat> bang, I'm going to have mercy on you. You can go. That would be wonderful. But then just as you're walking out of the courthouse, he says, uh, please come back a minute. And he puts his hand in his pocket and takes out the keys to his Mercedes and says, uh, I'm going to give you grace as well. Here's my car. Hallelujah. When you come to Christ, he has mercy upon you. But we're saved by grace. And grace bestows the blessings of God upon our lives. Praise the Lord. It says you were once, you were saved by grace through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Some people say, well, you know, I've made a mess of my life. I can never change. You can. Some people say, I don't know how I'll change. Of course you don't. None of us did. When I first started going to church, I used to think, these people read the Bibles every day. Some of them come in the week. I don't think I could ever do that. But you know, you could say, well, I don't think I, my life would ever change. What you don't understand is that the moment that you meet Jesus, the power of God comes into your life. And you're able to do things that you never thought you could do. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed. And basically, this is what he was saying. For years you've come into this place with your back on a bed. But now you're going to leave with your bed on your back. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> and I didn't get that out of anybody else's book. If you want to quote me... That's fine. For years you come into this place with your bed on, <laughs> with your back on a bed. Now you're going to go out with the bed on your back. Praise the Lord. Take up your bed and walk. That, in other words, that which you've been bound to, that which has controlled you, that that's been part of your life, leave it. Rise. Take up your bed. You're not coming back to this place. You're done with it. You're finished. You know, I talked to you about Lazarus this morning. The amazing thing is this. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he never wanted to go back and have a weekend in the tomb, did he? Because <laughs> it spelt death. Why would you want to go back to your old sins? Because they spell death. Hmm. So Jesus said, everything's changing from now on. That which has controlled you, you are now going to be in control. You know, when Paul went to the city of Ephesus, he had such a revival that they burned their books on witchcraft and idolatry and sorcery, made a huge bonfire in the city centre. This was people saying, we're done with the old life. That's not going to control us any longer. We're finished with it. That's the kind of break Jesus wants to make. Paul says, we all had our conversation in this world. In the Corinthian epistle in chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians verses 9 and 11, he says, such were some of you, and he talks about immorality and drunkenness and idolatry and fornication, homosexuality and so on. He says, such were some of you, but you were washed. You're sanctified. You're cleansed in the blood of Christ. You're different. That was you. But it's no longer you now. He says to this man, take up your bed, rise and, and walk. You don't have to be carried any longer. It's time to walk with God. It's time maybe for you, instead of thinking about it, to start doing it. The privilege can be yours. It's ours to walk with God. To walk with God. Hallelujah. To have him as your friend. To have him as your companion. To have him as the one who's with you when you lay your head on the pillow at night. And when you wake 
in the morning and every moment of every day. Walk. It's time to walk with God. There can be no excuses. You see, your history doesn't have to be your destiny. And the failures of yesteryear don't have to rule your present or destroy your future. It's time to rise up and recognize that the one who's in this meeting tonight is the same one who came into the pool of Bethesda to ask one man a simple question. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to leave this kind of life? If you do, rise, walk, pick up your bed. He didn't need a second command. He got up instantly healed by the power of God. I don't think he would want to go back there the following day. I don't think he'd want to go visiting too much. He'd spent too many years in that situation. We had an old man when we used to pastor in Ulverston. He was in his 80s and he got wonderfully saved. And every Sunday night when we would preach the gospel, he would come to me and he would say, Pastor, I just wished I'd heard this 40 years ago. Yeah. Yes, right. With tears trickling down his face. Yeah. He came to me one Sunday. He said, I'm going to be missing shortly because I'm going to see my daughter in Australia. He died before he could make that trip. But he emigrated to a better land. And one day, I'll meet him in heaven. I'll meet him in glory. Thank God for this amazing, wonderful salvation. Never lose sight of it. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoking flax he will not put out. You know, a smoking wick. Jesus doesn't come and put out the wick, the light. He fans it until there's a flame again. A bruised reed, one of the, re one of the ways they were used was for musical instruments. But if the reed was bruised or bent, you couldn't blow through that. You couldn't make any kind of musical sound because it was bruised. But the Bible says a bruised reed, he will not break. Do you know tonight, maybe, he just wants to put heaven's music back into your spirit and into your soul. The question is, do you want to be made whole? I'm not asking you tonight, do you believe in God? Most people do believe there's a God and so does the devil we have a president whether you agree with him or not you have a prime minister whether you agree with him or not I have never met President Trump and I have never met Prime Minister Boris Johnson I know Boris Johnson lives at number 10 and President Donald Trump in the White House. I know, I believe they exist, but I've never met them. You may believe God exists, but you've never met him. That is salvation. Do you want to be made whole? I'm going to give you that opportunity tonight to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And for that miracle to take place in your heart. Let's bow our heads for a moment in prayer. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. 
when I've finished, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never done that. You've known about him, but you've never met him. You've known about salvation, but it's never entered your heart. Like I said, there are no dress rehearsals. We're on stage now. The curtain's opened. One day it will close. Tonight you have opportunity to give your life over to the Saviour. I'm going to pray first. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I thank you for all the miracles that you record by your Holy Spirit in the Gospel accounts. There's a reason for every one of them being there. You can teach us something. And I pray tonight, in the name of Jesus, that you will open people's hearts, whatever their situation. And if there are those here tonight that have never given their lives over to you, I'm praying tonight by your Holy Spirit that you will touch them, open their lives, and grant them the simple faith to believe to the saving, the salvation of their soul. Let's just keep our heads bowed for a moment or two. As we're bowed in prayer, I'm going to ask you in a moment, if you want to give your life over to Christ, just to do something very simple, and yet it will signify to me that tonight you're giving your life over to the Lord Jesus. A miracle if you're sincere, will take place in your heart. I'm going to ask you just to lift your hand up in a moment. And when I've acknowledged it, take it down. I'm not going to ask you to come out to the front, but that's what I'm asking you to do. And by doing that, you'll be saying in your heart, yes, tonight I want to know him who died and rose again for me. So whilst we're bowed in prayer, if that's you tonight, would you just raise your hand up wherever you sat, just let me see it and then take it down. And I can promise you tonight, by the word of the Lord, that if you're sincere with God, a miracle will take place in your life. Just raise your hand up and then let me see it and then take it down. Let the Lord Jesus Christ change your situation tonight. Minister into your heart and into your life. Is there anyone you want to give your life over to this wonderful Saviour? Praise his wonderful name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.